Oh, it's on. Hello. Hi, I'm Carla Hayden with the Library of Congress, and it's great to see all of you, and we're almost ready to start. So we thought we'd get some warm-up stuff going, and this young lady's going to just have us do some stuff. Hello, hello. Hi. My name is Sasha. I'm with the Young Reader Center. We're downstairs, Great. and if you haven't been there, come visit us. And I'm also at the Young Reader Center. Yeah. So we are going to sing a song about the Young Reader Center. Uh, do you guys know what an abbreviation is? Yeah. Okay. So YRC stands for? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so we're going to sing a song about it, and it's really fun, and we want to make sure the adults participate too, right? Right? Okay, awesome. So maybe you can do the hands and we'll do the songs together. So You're everyone good. needs to kind of get yeah. this motion going? Yeah. Perfect. And at the end, we need you to be really, really loud. I'm sorry you have to be loud at the end. Okay, here we go. It goes like this. Two, one, two, three, we're at the YRC. Woo. One, two, three, we're at the YRC. If you want to read a book, Come on in and take a look. One, two, three, we're at the YRC in five, four, three, two, one, story time! <laughs> it's kind of a story time. All right, all right. So let's do one about who here likes to travel into space? One or two. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. So we'll do the same song, but we're gonna go zoom, 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 we're going to the moon, you ready? You guys can participate? Okay, I know you guys can sing, let's do it. Okay, we go. Zoom, 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 we're going to the moon. Zoom, 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 we're going to the moon. If you want to take a trip, come on up this rocket ship. Zoom, 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 we're going to the moon. In five, four, three, two, one, blast off! <laughs> okay, that's a little bit better. Okay, and then, what's the other one we have? We're going to the stars. Okay, um, maybe we'll go five, no, what rhymes with stars? Stars, okay, you guys are so smart. You've been to space a lot of times. Yeah, okay. <laughs> How can we make a lot of noise? Yeah. Disturb anybody? So wouldn't it be cool to make a lot of noise in the it's library? It's fun to make a lot of noise. So maybe we'll start. How many times? With the schools that? that are here. Yeah. What school are you guys with? Capital Hill, Day school. Capital Hill Day School. And who do we have over here? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So who's the loudest school right now? There you go. Okay, let me close the door first. There's a little Hold bit on. of a competition. <laughs> Ooh, I don't know. We're going to see who's louder. You guys ready? OK. We have two people on each side, OK? So we're going to be able to tell who is blowing our ear off stronger. Ladies, be the judges, yeah. because they're that right in the middle. Better. Let's do that. OK. You have a scale of one to five. And so you'll make the decision. OK. Yes. So first, we're going to see which school can clap the loudest, OK? So let's start with this one. OK, on the count of three, we're going to see which school can clap the loudest. So we'll have you guys go first. So one, two, three. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. That was pretty good. That's, that's pretty good. Yeah, I like that. You guys up for the challenge? Yeah. OK. 
on a count of three, two, one. Let's go. Three, two, one. Oh. oh. <laughs> Getting red in the face. Ooh, that is pretty close. That's the judges. So who thinks the Capitol Hill Day School was louder? Yeah. And who thinks the Montessori School was louder? Ooh, one. Oh, I think this is a win this time around. You guys, Capitol Hill Days. Okay. So how about who can stomp louder? Okay. Okay. Stomp louder. So on the count of three, okay. so stomp on this side. One, two, three. Sounds like a stampede. <laughs> and stop. Nice. You guys ready? All right, come back, come back with some stops. Let's go. Oh, people are getting up. You're getting into this. All right, all right. Judges, who thinks Montessori was winning out? Oh, it's so close. Yeah, Capitol Hill Dale School winning out? No? Oh, we have a championship at the Montessori School. You guys did great. Yay! Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Because all of that noise brought in our friends that have been trying to get here. Hello. Glad you're here. You could see we were making a little noise in the library and having fun, and we hope that all of you will have some more fun in just a few minutes, because we want to welcome all of you to the Library of Congress. And how many of you have been here before? Ah, oh, good group, good group. How many of you have ever stomped and made that much noise in any library? Okay, right. All right, it could happen, it can happen. Well, we have a number of schools that are here with us online, and we have a great list of schools, and they're from all over the country. Plus, we have public schools and schools right here in Washington, D.C. that are looking at us and gonna be listening online. So could you wave at everybody? And we're gonna show, hey! North Carolina, South Carolina, all of the schools that are here, and we're gonna give them a good shout out real soon and just say their names. So I'm the Librarian of Congress, and as you can tell, I'm a little excited about our program today because we have a very, very special guest. Many of you have met him, and you notice he has a medal around his neck, a gold medal, because he is the Librarian of Congress's Youth Ambassador for Young People's Literature. And that's very similar to being an Olympic medal winner. He won what's something that's called the MacArthur Genius Award, which is really like that. I know. <laughs> yes. Yes. Now, can anybody, and I know some of you have read his graphic books, tell me his name. <laughs> Yes, say it loud. Jean Yang. Give him the. Jean Yang. <laughs> Louder. Jean Yang. Yay! And there he is. As you know, he's gotten lots of awards, as I just mentioned. He's even had a chance to draw Superman. And if you don't know his story, he started drawing comic books when he was right around your age. And he has traveled around the country talking about books and reading and reading without walls. And he wants everyone, and that's what we're going to talk about today, to read a book that you normally wouldn't read. How many of you have read something, not just for school, but a book that you look at and you say, I don't know if I really want to read this. Ooh. Quite a few. Well, we're going to take the challenge. So I want to thank, though, some people for making this possible. And I had to write it down to make sure I didn't forget. And it's the Children's Book Council and Every Child a Reader Foundation for their support of us being here. And also Macmillan First Second Publishing for their help. So now I'm going to bring up our award-winning ambassador, Jean Yang. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hayden. Good morning. Thank you all for being here. It's such a thrill to be in this room with all these people who love books. This is like one of my favorite kinds of settings. Well, so uh, w the way we're going to start this morning off is, is uh, Dr. Hayden and I are going to ask each other questions, mostly about books. And then towards the end, we'd like to get some questions from you. So if, uh, if questions pop up in your head in the beginning, save those questions, file them away in the back of your head. And at the end, we want to hear those questions. What I'd like to first hear about is, is how you fell in love with books. Oh, well, I had the wonderful experience of having people around me who loved to read. And one of the first things they would do when I would go and visit my grandparents in the summer and things is they would read to me. And the first thing I wanted to do, though, was learn how to read, read my own stuff. It was nice being read to. I loved it. But I couldn't wait to start reading myself so I could get into it and read whatever I wanted to. I liked crime books. You like crime books? Like books about people doing bad things? Yeah. So <laughs> I found this book. My grandmother, nice little lady and everything, but she kind of liked mysteries and things like that. And so she had this book that I knew I wasn't supposed to look at. It was called Hollywood Babylon. How many of you all know what Babylon is? It was a wild place <laughs> back in the ancient days. And Hollywood, you know, where that is. And it was a true crime thing, right, with all these gruesome pictures, Fatty Arbuckle, just murders and stuff. And when I would come, you know, she'd make sure you know, she would put it away. And of course, I've spent most of my summer finding it. <laughs> and that's how I got hooked. And I said, boy, so at first I could just look at the pictures that were really, really gruesome. And then I want to know what it said. And that's what, that's what got you. True crime. True crime. True crime was what got Dr. Hayden. That's what got books. me going. That's great. That's great. Well, for me, I, I grew up in a, in a house of stories. My parents are both immigrants. My mom was born in mainland China. My dad in Taiwan, they both came to the United States for college uh, and, and met, fell in love, got married, had me. I grew up listening to their stories. Both my mom and my dad loved to tell stories. I think this is actually true uh, of a lot of immigrant families. A lot of parents who are from another country or another culture, they'll want to tell their kids stories from that country, from that culture as a way of building that connection. So I heard lots of stories from Chinese culture when I was a kid. But reading, for me, was actually kind of hard. I remember in early elementary school, um, my teachers would divide us into these two groups, right? Mm. And they would name them, I think they were named after like colors. I think one of them was like a red group and one of them was a blue group. But really, they were the fast and slow readers. Everybody knew the Who colors weren't fo fooling anybody. And I was, I was definitely always on the slow side. <laughs> At the very end of every month, our teacher would make us line up by how many pages we'd read that month. Aww. And I was always either last or second to last. It was like me and my best friends, my best friend would trade places. But, um, and, and, and eventually the, the way I kind of got through that was my mom would sit down and read to me. She, she would read with me. Even now though, I'm not a fast reader. But what I realized is you don't have to read fast in order to love books, right? right. You just have to read. It doesn't matter how quickly or slowly you do it. You can still enjoy the book. Right, and, and sometimes you want to read slow so you can get what you want out of it or everything like that. Yes. And I, it, it pains me sometimes to hear uh, people of your age group and certainly in my age group where it, it made reading not fun. Yeah. And that's what the cool thing about reading is it's fun. But to have to go through all that, it, it, does, it takes a little bit from it. Yeah, yeah, it, it does, it, it does. I, I, think, um, I think there are ways in which um, learning to enjoy reading in the beginning can make it so that you can get through some things that are more difficult to read later, right? Because you'll right. remember the fun, and that'll push you through some of the harder stuff that you'll have to read as you get older. That's why when people say, oh, we're going to read to babies and little kids and everything, that's to get them ready because they know there's something good if you figure out what all this text is. If you figured out, you know there's a secret in there. There's something that's really cool in there. And it, it gives you that. Yeah, 
Yeah. So you love that true crime book as a kid. Were there any other I favorites? still have it. <laughs> Were there any other it. favorites? Oh, Little Women. I like okay. that. Louisa May Alcott. And the one that I brought here today is my all-time favorite when I was a little girl um, called Bright April. It was the first book that I learned about. And you see I have my uh, Reading Without Walls bookmark. So take that when you get um, the first one. Oh, the Walter Award, too. Um, the first book that I checked out over and over and over to the point that I had library fines and didn't even realize it because this book was the first book that I saw myself in. It was a little girl who had pigtails, who was a brownie, and she was brown just like me. And when I, you know, I'm quite a bit older than you, Jean. Uh, and when I was coming up, there weren't many books that portrayed people that looked like me, much less talked about my history or anything like that. And I just, to this day, I just love this book because I could see myself in something that was important, like books. If books are important, but you don't see yourself in them, what yeah. does that say? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, had, a, I had a similar issue. It, it was very hard when I was a kid to find characters who look like me in the books that I was reading and in the television shows that I was watching. Oh, yeah. And, and I wonder if that's why I drifted towards superhero comics. I started reading superhero comics when I was in fifth grade. The very first superhero comic that I bought was an issue of, of Superman. It was with Superman and the Atomic Knights. You all know who the Atomic Knights are? They're a little bit more obscure, but they're these dudes. There's okay. an older gentleman. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> The, the nerds have just outed themselves. That's right. If you know who the Atomic Knights are, you're definitely a nerd. But, but there are these dudes who um, dress up in medieval-style armor, and they ride around on these giant mutated dogs. They're, Ew. Yeah. It was kind of awesome. I got to say, it was kind of awesome. Okay. But I wonder if I drifted towards superheroes because I had a hard time finding characters who look like me. Because right. superheroes, people don't realize this, but, but almost every major superhero out there, you know, Superman, Batman... Iron Man, the Hulk, they're all created by children of immigrants. They're all created by these sons of Jewish immigrants from Europe. Uh, and I think that's why every superhero has like these two identities. You know, I had two identities when I was a kid. I had uh, one name, a, a Chinese name that I used at home. I had an English name that I used at school. I spoke one language at home, another one at school. It was almost like that. It was like how, how Superman is both Superman and Clark Kent. So I, I don't even know if I was conscious of it as a kid, but that definitely felt really familiar to me. That idea of two cultures and how you speak and how you are at home and how you are outside of the home is a common theme, I think, with a lot of cultures. Yeah, I think that's true. I think, um, you know, I, I actually think that's, that's one of the best things about being an American is that um, you can be an American without giving up that core piece of yourself, you know, because, because America is a collection of diverse communities, and that's, that's one of our strengths. Someone once told me when we were talking about having uh, and being in this country where there are so many people looking all types of ways and just, just this variety is, what if you only had one type of ice cream flavor and you could never have anything else? Yeah. Think yeah. about that. It would be terrible. It would you be, may uh, think it it's good punishment. now to just have chocolate. It would be a punishment. But it would be a punishment, yeah. and how exciting it is to take. That's how I feel about different types of books, too. Yeah. So was it your love of books that led to you becoming a librarian? Oh, sure, sure. I had musical parents, and I didn't have musical talent. So <laughs> <laughs> I learned early on, but I always loved to read. And when I found out that there was a, a profession, something that you could do to, to introduce and, and, and really get the excitement, I mean, look. We're right here, we're stomping our feet, we're talking about Superman, and we're doing all this cool stuff. And so I, when I found out about being a librarian, I was hooked on that too. Was there a moment when you knew you yes. were gonna be a librarian? There was a moment when I was working on a, in a storefront library, similar to the one when I found out about, okay. yeah, Bright April, back in New York, in Queens. And I was working with the young, man named Leonard, uh, he was 10, and he would come in every day, and I was a kind of an apprentice. Uh, I wasn't a librarian yet, I hadn't even started library school. And he would come in every day, 
and just sit next to me and I would give him stuff and he would draw because a lot of the kids made fun of him mm. and, and that. And so just knowing and putting the right book with Leonard and getting him to draw and stuff was when I said, okay, this is, this is cool stuff. That's great. That's great. I, I do think that maybe that's the thing too. Maybe kids who um, other kids might make fun of uh, often drift towards books. I, I was definitely one of those kids. I was a kid where other kids would make fun of me, but I was also a kid who would make fun of other kids. So I was on both oh, sides. Oh, you were both. I was, a, I was a jerk. I was definitely a jerk. People were jerks to me, and I was also a, a jerk back. See, they were jerks to me, and I was one of those kids that all the, um, I wasn't a, one of the cool ones and everything, and at the last day of school, I'd have to run home because all the cool girls would say they were going to beat me up. Ooh, but I could run that fast. Sounds, that sounds... <laughs> I couldn't run fast. See, so you had to fight back. You yeah, had to I be had a, a jerk, I, too. I had a, I had, yeah, I had to be a jerk, too. But, but I do think, um, like, working on books, uh, writing and drawing is a way of working that stuff out. Like, if you, if you have, you know, problems in your life, I think all of us do, writing and drawing is a great way of just figuring that out for yourself. I have a friend who's an art teacher. He teaches art at a high school. And he says that out of all of the classes that a kid takes in high school, the art class is the only one where the subject is themselves. They're trying to figure themselves wow. out by, by making art. I think that's true not just of drawing, but also of any kind of art, including writing. And what about music, too? And yeah, stuff music, like that. too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, and I think that's why sometimes um, if you have things that are painful in your life, you can find a little bit of healing. By, by writing and by drawing. So did you, and I have to ask you this, so in, in drawing superheroes and things like that, did you get any revenge? <laughs> um, like did I, make up, did I make up bad guys based on, uh, not, I don't think I ever did it consciously because I was worried about getting in trouble. But the very first superhero comic I did was in fifth grade. I did it with my friend Jeremy Kuniyoshi, who was half Jewish and half Japanese. And we were both the, the comic book kids in our class. So during lunch, when our more athletic friends were playing tetherball, do you all still play tetherball? Yes. It's awesome, right? Except that I was terrible at it. it was, the, the ball would always hit me in the head. <laughs> so, so instead of playing tetherball, Jeremy and I would sit at the tables and we would draw comics together. Then we would give our originals to his mom, who would take them to work with her, mm. and wait till all of her coworkers went home and sneak photocopies for us. <laughs> we would take these photocopies, we staple them by hand to make our own comics, and we sold our cool. comics to our classmates for nice. 50 cents a piece. It was awesome. We made $8. It was the best. <laughs> Nowadays, if you want to do the same thing, you cannot sell for 50 cents. Prices have gone up. You've got to charge at least $1.50. <laughs> but it was great. It was great. I think, I think working on that comic, um, taught me how to tell stories. Working on that comic gave me a way of, I was, I was also a pretty shy kid too. It was weird, right? Being, a shy, being shy and also a jerk. But I was a pretty shy kid. So working on that comic gave me a way of expressing myself in ways that I couldn't with my, you know, by just talking. How did the stories come to you? I mean, did you just wake up and... Okay, when I was in fifth grade, I thought, I thought I was kind of like a, like a, you know, I thought I was like super creative and stuff. So I thought, oh man, I just woke up in this, this, this character form fully formed in my head. But then as an adult, I look back on the character we made up and I realized, no, he was actually just a ripoff. He was a ripoff character of Robin Hood because he, he wore all green and he lived in the woods and he had, a, he had a band of friends that he used to call his merry men, just like Robin Hood. Yeah, I think that's pretty close. Yes, isn't it? It's a yeah. little close. But our, we, we did, there was one difference. The difference was, um, our character, instead of fighting with a bow and arrow, he actually had a discus of death that he would throw at people's heads. You were kind of true crime <laughs> fantasy stuff. A little bit, stuff. a little bit. Yeah, that was yeah, a little so, bit but, of... But, you know, I, I, actually, think, I actually think now as, a, as an adult, even though that one character was terrible, I do think that um, sometimes kids think creativity is just like when you make stuff up out of nothing. But that's almost never true. No. You know, you can't make stuff up out of nothing. What, you, what, you, what real creativity is, I think, is combining things together that were never combined before. You know? So if you love right. superheroes and you take something else that you love, I don't know, maybe like chocolate cake, and you figure out a way to make a superhero based on chocolate cake, that'll be a really creative idea. Let's work on that one. Yeah, yeah, I, mean, I agree. <laughs> it's something, though, when you think about, so what are you working on now? What is the reading without walls? 
Yes. So uh, that's I've got. I mean, don't forget the bookmarks and everything. That's right. That's right. Two Januarys ago, I was in this very room in January of 2016, uh, and the, the Library of Congress, Every Child a Reader, and the Children's Book Council. They gave me this fancy medal. To this day, this is the fanciest thing I own. <laughs> this is as bling bling as Jean Yang gets right here. <laughs> if you want to touch this, come up later. I'll let you touch it. It's kind of awesome. It's got your name engraved. Yeah, too. it's got my name on the back, I too. See it. It's got my name on the back. And, and they named me the fifth national ambassador for young people's literature, which, which just means that uh, for my two-year term, 2016 and 2017, my job is to get both more kids reading and kids reading more. The way I'm doing that is I've been going around the country issuing what I call the Reading Without Walls Challenge. You know, one of the best things about growing up is you all get to explore the world. That's like your primary job right now, is to figure wow. out how the world works. Mm. And books are a great way of exploring the world. So I want us all to read books outside of our comfort zones. Read books that are actually exploring books. You know, books that are not the normal books that we would read. So the challenge works like this. You can either do this as a community, or you can do this just as an individual reader. You set yourself a due date, by that due date, just do one of three things. Number one, you can read a book about a character who doesn't look like you or live like you, somebody who's very different from you. Two, you can read a book about a topic that you might not know anything about, something that you might even find intimidating. Or three, you can read a book in a format that you normally wouldn't read for fun enough. So if normally all you read are chapter books, I want you to give a graphic novel a try. Yeah. If normally all you read are graphic novels and comic books, then I want you to try a, a, a chapter book or a collection of poetry or an audio book. Just try lots of different kinds of stories in different formats. If you really want to go for the gold star, find a book that fits all three of those categories. Wow. So I've been talking about this um, all over America to, to, to different communities, and I've really been shocked by the ways in which readers and librarians and, and teachers and bookstore owners have really come up and, and met this challenge. It's been great. When I thought about you being here and talking about reading without walls and books that I've read that at first I thought, oh, I don't know. I thought about the book Sea Biscuit. Okay. Okay. It's about a horse and I'm like, I've only seen in person maybe two horses in my life, right? City kid, all of this, that wasn't it. And it's all about this horse who was an underdog and it was, he was like a half mule and a half this and nobody thought he could win. And when I got into the book though, learned all about horses and that, but also this spirit of the underdog and that yeah. theme came through and I turned into a Seabiscuit fan <laughs> and watched horse races. That's great. Because now great. I know a little bit about it. Something, something similar happened to me with, with basketball. Uh, as a kid, I hated basketball because I was terrible at it. I had these friends who were really good at it, and whenever we played, it was just like tetherball. The, the basketball would find a way of hitting me in the head. So I hated it. I didn't follow basketball. I remember in, in college, I lived with these guys who were huge basketball fans, and we would watch movies, you know, at home on our VCR. You all know what that is, a VCR? You do? <laughs> it's like Netflix, except you have to have, like, these A VCR? That you stick in. So we would, watch, we would watch movies on our VCR, and then when when like 10.30, 10.45 came around, they would force us to pause the movie so that they could watch sports highlights on the news. And I was always so mad about it. But uh, a, a few years ago, I started reading books about basketball. I read one called Outside the Paint about um, the basketball scene in 1940s San Francisco Chinatown. I read uh, Slam Dunk. You ever read Slam Dunk? I've heard it's of it. It's amazing. It's awesome. One of the best manga series out there. Uh, I read Matt De La Pena's Ball Don't Lie. I read a bunch of books about basketball, and that got me really interested. And now, uh, I'm still not an expert. I'm still no basketball expert. Like, when I watch a basketball game now, um, there will still be times when all the action will stop on the court, and I'll have no understanding of why. But at least I, I feel you it. Got, right. You know what I mean? I can feel the thrill of the game now. And, and it's, that, it's because of books, in part because right. of books. And things that you've never experienced. Yes. But really getting into it and yeah. saying, okay, I'm going to yeah. try this. Yeah. I'm going to try it. Now, I noticed something here. This easel with nothing on it. Yes. Were you going to put something on it? <laughs> I mean, were we going to actually? We could put something on it. We could put something on it. So what I was thinking wow. we could do is maybe we could design a superhero together. Does that sound okay? We could design a superhero together. Okay, we'll start from the head and we'll move down. Don't forget the chocolate. 
Yes, yes, maybe a chocolate cake superhero. Maybe you a don't have to. It's okay. okay, so I'm going to start by giving them a big round head. Does the head have to be, okay, round? All right, big round head. Now somebody tell me what's, what's on the superhero's face. What do you think is on the superhero's face? Can yes, you young see? lady right there. A mustache. Okay, a mustache. Okay, now, all right. I have a little mustache, so. Okay, a mustache, and then, and then what else? What else is on this face? Go ahead. A round top hat. You all are going with some really non-traditional <laughs> superhero gear, which is fine. Okay, so a round top hat. Are they pulling our legs? <laughs> a round top hat. What else? What else? Tell me about this character's ears. Tell me about this character's ears. He should have, he should have like, little candles, like, sticking out the side of his head. Candles. Candles instead of ears. Okay. Oh, you don't have to go with the chocolate cake. It's okay. Don't worry. We'll just have some chocolate cake later. Okay. So candles sticking out of the side of his head instead of ears. Okay, we still haven't gone to... Somebody tell me about his eyes. Somebody tell me about his eyes. Yes. He has glasses. Glasses. He has glasses, okay. Some of the, my older colleagues might remember Mr. Magoo. <laughs> so All right. I kind of have a Mr. Magoo All right, look. how about, okay, let's start moving down now. Tell me, tell me about this character's body. Tell me about this character's body. Yes, young lady. A jumpsuit. <laughs> what kind of jumpsuit? Give me a little bit more information about this jumpsuit. An or okay, so I don't have orange. Let's just, oh, I do. I do have. I do have orange. Okay, an orange jumpsuit, like a like a track suit. Is that what you're thinking? Like if old school Run, D Run DMC style track suit. Okay, let's let's do this. Orange. Okay, a jumpsuit. I have actually never personally worn a jumpsuit. So I'm not entirely positive what one looks like. <laughs> Tell me if I do it right, okay? So don't jumpsuits normally have like a... Uh, oh yeah, it's coming down the side. Stripes on the side? Is that true? Am I making that up? And you want an orange? We have red up here. Is red close enough? All right, red. So we'll do red. Looking kind of spiffy. All right, then somebody tell me about his hands. Ooh. Somebody tell me about his hands. Somebody tell me about his hands. Yes. Yes. Tentacles. What's that? Tentacles. Tentacles. Ooh. You sound like somebody who reads a lot of Japanese comics. Is that true? <laughs> there are a lot of tentacles in Japanese comics. Okay. All right, let's do that. We'll do tentacles. So I feel like we're losing out on the, uh, the chocolate cake theme here. But that's okay. They can do something else. We'll have chocolate okay. cake later. Because I want you to... Okay, let's, do, let's just do tentacles on one side. Somebody tell me about the other side. They can have two different... Okay. Yeah, we can, we can, there are no rules. No, no rules. rules. When it comes to, this is good. Okay, okay, yes. Okay, first, there's cake residue on his, is his face. Cake residue on his face. Okay. And we can do that. Getting personal, people. And there are, like, brown... Cake residue. And then he has, like, a brown cake residue. sparkle shooter thing. Does that look like cake residue? That looks like he just has a fungus Honestly. on his face. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you know? Excuse me. Okay, cake residue on his face, and then what was the other thing? The, um, his hand is like a um, sparkle shooter. But it's brown like sparkle shooter thing. A sparkle shooter? A brown sparkle shooter. I'm not, okay, so I'm going to guess as, what a, as to what a sparkle shooter looks like, all right? It's a cake shooter. It's a cake shooter. Is this what a sparkle shooter looks like? That actually looks like uh, dandelions. Maybe I'll add more color and it'll look more like a sparkle shooter. Okay. All right, so somebody tell me about his feet. Somebody tell me about his feet. All the way over there? Um, one is really big and the other is really small. 
One is really big and the other is really small. Good, good, we'll do that. And then, and then how, about, how about his shoes? What do his shoes look like? What do his shoes look like? Yes, young lady here. Um, be one pink and one red. One pink and one red. One foot is really big and one foot's really small. All right. <laughs> so here's his really big foot. It's like a clown foot. And here's his really small foot. And we'll do some laces. And one is pink and one is red, you said? Okay. So all I have are red, blue, green, and purple up here. Is there an alternative that, to pink that we could choose? Purple. 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 Got it. Got it. Anything else you want to add? How about a, how about a little, uh, a little uh, animal sidekick? Who would his animal sidekick be? Whoa. Who would his animal sidekick be? Yes, young lady a, right here. A talking cherry. A talking <laughs> cherry? <laughs> All right. Okay, we'll do that. We'll do that. A cherry? Okay. Okay, and I think we're pretty close to being done. Oh, I think there's some more. Okay, let's do, let's do, let's do one more thing, one more thing, one more thing. Can okay, they have yes. another sidekick to go On his shoes, tip? add cupcake boosters. Cupcake boosters. <laughs> That's amazing. Okay, so what would a cupcake booster even look like? It would look like... All right, I think we need one last thing. We need one last thing, and that is... Hair. What is his name? What is his name? What is his name? Yes, young lady, right there. It should be... Um, um, Jeff the Weirdo. Jack? Jeff. Jeff the Weirdo. I Are you think that fits. Are you named Jeff right now? Are you mad at somebody named Jeff right now? No. Okay, Jeff the Weirdo. Can he have an icing cake? Jeff the Weirdo. How about Superhero. Who is the superhero? Jack the Weirdo. Jeff would Weirdo attract is, attention. Weirdo is E before I, right? It's one of the few words that doesn't follow that rule. Who's and how about the, how about his cherry sidekick? What's 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 that? What's the cherry sidekick's name? Yes. Mr. Cherry. Peep peep. Peep peep. I'm not sure if this is going to get option for television. All right. Not sure. Might. So I will talk to DC Comics to see if Jeff the Weirdo and his talking peep peep character <laughs> can actually make their way into the DC universe. No guarantees, no guarantees. But I'd like you all to give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> that is truly a superhero like I have never, never seen before. Never seen before. <laughs> yeah. What's that? You forgot an icing cape. An icing cape. We'll have to add that in, in in the second issue. We'll add in the ice Ah, the so, second issue. And it's um, symbol. Oh, yeah, and he needs a symbol. You're right. And he needs a symbol. So th those are all things that he has to earn in issue number two. And that's how you develop different <laughs> issues, right? <laughs> that's how you develop different issues, yeah. Well, you know, I, I've written in, in two different environments. I've written uh, for graphic novels where you kind of just make up a story and you tell it from beginning to end all in one shot usually. And I've also worked on series. So right now I'm working on a series called Secret Coders and I'm working on a series for DC Comics called uh, New Superman about this brand new character, uh, a Chinese Superman in the cool. DC Universe. 
But when you're working on a oh, series, you're giving thank a hand. You. Yeah. But when you're working on a series, there is this element of making things up as you go along. It's kind of like when you're, you know, when I was your age and I would tell stories, I would just make it up as I went along. So working on a series is like that. Wow. Now the Secret Coders, tell me about that one. Secret Coders is a, is a, a graphic novel series I'm doing with a friend of mine named Mike Holmes. Before becoming a full-time cartoonist, I taught high school computer science. I taught kids how to code computers for 17 years. Wow. And I've always wanted to take what I did in my classroom and stick it into a graphic novel series. So that's exactly what Secret Coders is. Mike and I are trying to teach kids how to code computers through this comic book series. There will be six volumes in all. Uh, volume number three just came out. We're really excited about it. Yeah. We're super excited about it. How many of you know how to code or what coding is? All right. Very good. number good. of you. That's great. That's great. Good. Now, now, speaking of computers, um, how do you think things are changing for, for the library? Oh, the library. Library of Congress, for instance, right now, you can go up on the website, and we just revamped it so it looks much, much cooler. And you can download from thousands and thousands of photographs in the collection of the library and use them however you want to. Wow. It's for free. really something for Download, free. Download. And where are these photos from? Oh, they're from everywhere. We have photographs that tell you about history. We have photographs that other people have taken to show different cultures. And you can just about type any subject in, and photographs will come that you can then download and use in any report, in any art, or any way you want to use them. So that's what makes it cool. That's great. That's great. You don't have a favorite photo in your collection, do you? Not yet. OK. Not yet. I'm six months in, and I'm discovering, so I'm um, tweeting. And every day that I'm here, I put up something cool that I've found That's and great. I've seen, like Thomas Jefferson's handwriting in his own hand when he was writing the, um, working on the Declaration of Independence and seeing him and, and what he put in and what he took out. I think oh, people don't realize there are drafts of certain things that you hear about, but they, they did a lot of cross outs and thought about things. And it's really nice to see, okay, this didn't come up just perfect, that they had to work on it. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually think that that was something that I had to learn um, you know, as I grew up and, and, and started making stories as an adult. When I was a kid and I read books, I always thought, man, this came into that author's head perfectly formed, mm -hmm. and they just wrote it down and sent it to the publisher, and the publisher made it into a book. Uh, after I got into books, I realized that is not the case at all, that there's so much revision that happens. There's so much stuff where you write something down, and you're not super satisfied with it, and you just change it and change it and tweak it and tweak it until it gets to where you want it to be. I would say maybe, maybe even half of writing, half of making stories is, is that. It's changing yeah. and, and yeah. making. So when you see that even the Declaration of Independence, yes. there were cross-outs and there were thoughts and there were things like that. Yeah. And Abraham Lincoln, the Gettysburg Address, to see his whole handwriting and what he thought. So even somebody like Abraham Lincoln couldn't get it right the first couldn't time. Couldn't get it right the first right? time. Had to, but he had worked to go on back it. And, and the thing about Abraham Lincoln, his that wonderful speech that he gave was the shortest speech that day. One guy gave a speech for three hours. Can you imagine? One speech, three hours. And Abraham Lincoln got up and it was five minutes. And they said that was the best speech of the day because it was short and to the point. Yeah, yeah. Another thing that I had to learn as a, as a professional writer is that um, often longer doesn't mean better. I remember uh, when I was in high school and I would write things for my English class, I would always try to make my, my sentences as long as possible, and I would put in as many big words as I could. Like words where I barely even understood what they meant. Right. right? And I wanted to do it because I felt like it would make me sound smarter. But now, as an, as an adult, as a professional writer, I realize what makes you sound smart is actually just being clear. If you can say something as clearly as possible, as simply as possible, that is the best and the smartest way of saying it. Have you ever, in, in a book that I read that in a different format, The Reading Without Words, is a graphic novel, uh, a graphic uh, march by John Lewis yep. about the civil rights. Oh, you've read it? Oh, good. Because I had never read 
sorry, Gene. <laughs> no, never no, really no. read a graphic book. And I thought, oh. And then I got into it. And then I was like, wow, I want volume two and volume three. Yeah. Yeah. And we're even thinking, and I talked to you about that, a graphic book about the Library of Congress. What do you think about that? Okay, telling the story of the Library of Congress in I, graphic format. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a, a, an amazing book series, March. How many of you have read March? Awesome. So if you haven't read it yet, you are in for a treat. Go and yeah. find it at your local library. I'm sure they'll have it. Read it. It's a, it's a non-fiction book, so it's about real events. It's an autobiography. Uh, it's uh, Congressman John Lewis writing about his life. Uh, I recently visited a museum. It's called the Toonzeum. It's out mm. of Pittsburgh. And there they have a focus on, um, on comics art. So it's all these pages of comic book stories. It's pages from graphic novels. And you can see the, it's the original, so you can see how the artist actually draws. They had an exhibit there of uh, an old comic book that most of us don't remember, but it was about uh, Martin Luther King Jr. And it was a 22-page comic. John Lewis, Congressman John Lewis, when he was a kid, he read right. that comic book. And that comic book was so influential on him that when it came time for him to tell his own story about his own life, he wanted to tell it as a comic book, as a thick comic book, as a graphic novel. So it just goes to show that even things that seem forgotten, like that old comic book about Martin Luther King Jr., they're not forgotten. When you tell stories, when you release your own stories into the world, you have no idea how they're going to affect people years down the road. And one thing that you might not know about the Library of Congress is that we have the largest collection of comic books in the world, right here. Did you know that? First edition of Batman, Luke Cage, all of that right here at the Library of Congress, and we are going to display some of those things during Awesome Con. Okay. That's going to be here in Washington, D.C. with movies and comics and all of these types of things, and the Library of Congress is going to be part of Awesome Con. That's so great. So That's so great. That's another there. reason. There's so many reasons why the Library of Congress is awesome. Yet another reason. Largest comic book collection in the entire world. It looks like we're, we're winding down, so uh, we would like now to take questions from all of you. We have a whole bunch of students joining us from all over the, the country, and unfortunately those students are not going to be able to ask us questions. So I want to acknowledge that they're with us first, and then we'll take some questions from the kids in the room, okay? So right now we're being joined by uh, Alderman Elementary, by Valley Springs Middle School, by St. Stephen's Elementary, Hopewell Elementary of Trinity, Jacobs Fork Middle School, Triad Math and Science Academy, St. Ambrose School, Norton High, North Columbus Elementary, the College of Education at Governor State University, and students from DC public schools all around the city. So thank you all thank so much you. for joining us. So kids in the room, what kind of questions can we answer for you? Yes. Okay, so this question might sound weird, but is DC Comics, like, is it like a building in DC or is it just called DC Comics? That oh. is not a weird question at all, because DC the name is super confusing, right? It's a weird name. It's kind of, like Marvel makes yeah. sense, I think. DC Comics is, is a little bit weird. DC Comics' is office building used to be in New York City. It was in New York City for, for decades and decades. Now it's in Burbank, California, which is just outside of Hollywood. Uh, I got to visit the DC Comics office uh, a couple of times now, and it's pretty awesome. You walk into their waiting area, they have giant statues of Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman wow. wearing the costumes that they'll be wearing in the upcoming Justice League movie. They have a, a chess set in the middle of the waiting room that has, instead of the traditional chess pieces, it's like Superman and Wonder Woman and Batman and Joker mm. on the other side. Really cool. The name DC Comics is actually, it actually comes from the very first comic book series that DC Comics ever published. It was called Detective Comics. It came out in 1939. So the DC of DC Comics is actually short for Detective Comics, which makes it a really weird name, right? Because DC Comics then, it just means it's Detective Comics Comics. 
but it's, that's just the way it is. Since DC is our, is our oldest surviving comic book company in America, and you know, like sometimes stuff from the olden days, a little bit weird. Yes, young lady. For your comic books, um, do you have like a person who helps you have ideas for them, or is it just you by, by yourself having the ideas for your books? So the question is, do I just have ideas on my own, or do I have somebody helping me with, with ideas? And I would say it depends on the book. So when I'm writing for DC Comics, the stories that I'm writing are part of a bigger universe. You know, right now I'm writing uh, about a, a character named Ken and Kong, who is the Chinese Superman. Ken and Kong is in the same universe as Clark Kent, as Bruce Wayne, as, as all the other superheroes. So in that case, I can't just have ideas on my own. I actually have to collaborate with other artists and with other writers. But then when I write books for my other publisher, First Second Books, most of those are standalone graphic novels. So they're a story with a beginning, middle, and end. And for those, I generally just have ideas on my own. Sometimes I'll work with a partner, but often they'll start off as, as just in my own head. All right, that sounds like a question from somebody who uh, might be wondering where ideas come from. Is that true for you? Okay, so, th so I, I get this question a lot. Um, kids will sometimes ask me where my ideas come from. Often, my ideas come from my own life. You know, sometimes if you feel like you have a creative assignment and you don't have any ideas for it, just think about your own life. Even if your own life seems boring, I guarantee you if you think about it long enough, it is not. So for instance, the very first comic I ever did as an adult is called Gordon Yamamoto and the King of the Geeks. It's about a young man who gets a spaceship stuck inside of his nose and becomes friends with the alien that's living inside of the ship. That book is from my own life. <laughs> I've always Tell had sinus problems. Oh, I've okay. always had sinus problems. And one day I thought, what if what was plugging up my nose was a spaceship? Think about your life long enough, I guarantee you ideas are going to come out. I need that now. <laughs> yes. How did you feel um, when you released your first book? How did I feel? Like the very first book that I released was in fifth grade. It was, it was amazing. When you were like a grown up. As a grown-up, the first book that I released was uh, Gordon Yamamoto and the King of the Geeks. I actually self-published that, so I didn't even go through a publisher. I just got it printed up myself, and I tried to go to stores and local comic book conventions to sell it by hand. Uh, and it was great. It was a lot of work. It's a lot of work to publish your own comic. But I remember being at a comic book convention and handing that book to somebody and having them hand me uh, a few dollars it felt great. It felt great that somebody wanted to read my book so much that they were willing to part with $3 bills for it. It was awesome. Yes, young man in the front. When did you make your first comic book? When did I make my first comic? The very first comic I remember making was in fifth grade. Was that that uh, the, the main character was a, was a rip-off of Robin Hood. It was a terrible comic, but it was still fun to make. Anybody there... in the middle? Do you have any more copies of the books that you had from when you were younger? Do I have any more copies? I'm sure if I went back to my parents' house and I dug around, I'd be able to find one. Yeah, of, of that fifth grade comic. I also, uh, when I was in sixth grade, I made a comic about um, somebody who sh sold shoes. I don't even know what I was thinking. I made a comic about somebody who sold shoes, and I made a comic about, um, do you know what the Smurfs are? Yeah. Mm. And you know what the Transformers are? Yeah. I made a comic called The Trans Smurfers, <laughs> where all the Smurfs would transform into a robotic fruit. <laughs> that was fun to work on. Okay. That was fun to work on. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so this isn't really related to your book, but what's your favorite basketball team, if you like basketball? Okay, so the question is, what is my favorite basketball team? Uh, I want to hear you yours. Say? I want to hear yours. I come from the Bay Area, oh, so I'm there's from... only one answer, right? There's only one answer. I, I have to go with the Warriors. I'm from Chicago. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Drop the mic. <laughs> Duh, Bears. Oh, that's football. Uh, how, about, how about the young lady right there in the, yep. 
What materials do you use to make your comics? I'm sorry, what was that? What materials do you what use? What materials? That's great. Okay, so when I was your age, I read this book called How to Make Comics the Marvel Way. Hmm. It was, it was uh, written by Stan Lee, and Stan Lee I told me I had to wow. use a certain set of materials. He told me I had to use Bristol board, which is, um, it's like this super thick white paper, really, really thick. He told me I had to use a certain kind of pencil. He told me I had to use uh, a brush and a bottle of ink. So I did. That's how I started off making comics. Then after I uh, became an adult, after I started going to conventions and hanging out with other cartoonists, I realized that not everybody makes comics the Marvel way. Almost every cartoonist you talk to, they will have figured out their own set of materials. So if you want to make comics, if you want to make art in general, you should experiment. You should figure out what materials feel best for you. Right now, uh, I am using a regular number two pencil to draw. I'm using what's called a blue pencil to do my sketching. It's a certain shade of blue called non-photo blue. And I no longer ink with a brush and a bottle of ink. I actually ink with a Japanese brush pen. So I don't need that bottle of ink anymore. Yes, young lady with the headband. What is your Chinese name? My Chinese name. So my Chinese name is, oh, it's, my American name is a transliteration of my Chinese name, meaning my, my parents picked my American name because it sounded kind of like my Chinese name. So my American name is Jean Luen Yang. My Chinese name is Yang Jing Luen. Now that middle character, Jing, uh, has an interesting story behind it. You know, uh, it's, a, it's a Chinese tradition to give, gift, give the gift of gold to babies when they're first born. So when I was first born, I got all this gold from my relatives. Uh, and then after I became an adult, my mom gave me this gold. So when I got this gold as an adult, I looked through it, and on one of these little plates, it had my name. It had Yang Jing Lun, but the middle character, Jing, was a different character. It sounded the same, but it was a totally different word. And, and I was like... I was like, you know, my aunt who gave this to me, she didn't even know my name. She got my, my, my name wrong. And my mom said, no, she didn't get it wrong. That was your actual name when you were first born. So I said, okay, so what does this Jing mean? And she says, that Jing means splendid. And I said, it means splendid? You named me splendid? Why did you change that? <laughs> and she said, well, um, after you turned one and you started walking around, you kept hitting your head. <laughs> so we changed it to another Jing which means careful. So that's what my name means now in Chinese. It means careful. Yes? How many comics have you made since you started? So the question is, how many comics have I made since I started? I have made a lot. It's actually kind of hard to count. I did 10 issues of Superman. I'm working on issue number 13 of, of New Superman. So right there, I've done, I've done 23 issues for DC Comics. And then for a first second, I've, I've done a lot. I, I've maybe done... I don't know, 12, 12, 12 books now? And, and, then, uh, and then I've also worked on the Avatar The Last Airbender comics. Uh, I did 15 volumes of that so far. So I've done a lot. Wow. I've done a lot. Yes, young man in the... Oh, yep. Um, what's your favorite book, comic book? What's my, okay, so my, my favorite book when I was a kid I'm really sad that, that, um, that it's, it's been a little bit forgotten. So I want you all to try to read this book today, okay? It's, I, I love the, the Book of Three. Hmm. It's a series of books by Lloyd Alexander. Yeah. They were my, they were my favorite. They, as a librarian, you must have yeah. seen that go out a lot, Lord. right? Like, my generation loved that book. It, it seems like... Uh, it's been lost. It's been a, been a little time. bit lost. Yeah, but it's so really I'm, cool. I'm trying to bring it back. <laughs> Good, Lloyd Alexander, <laughs> classic. Yeah, yeah I, I love Lloyd Alexander. And then, and then in terms of comic books, um, you know, March is a really great comic book. You all, you all ought to read that. Um, there's, there's just a ton of comic books that I love. I don't know if I could pick one favorite. Uh, I, I really do love Mouse, though. It's, a, it's a little bit older. It's a nonfiction book about the, the Holocaust. So it's a really sad. Uh, and, and heart-wrenching book, but I think it's brilliantly done. And then I have a question. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sure. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, what, what was the first book that the Library of Congress had in their library? That's a great question. Wow. I want to know, too. I don't know. <laughs> 
the first book. There were about two or three hundred books in 1800, and they were the library was actually part of the Capitol, and they had books like the Bible and some other books that they thought that it would be good, and dictionaries and things that they thought it would be good for Congress. But thank you for asking that, because I'm going to find out what was the very first book that someone purchased for the library. That's great. Well, can, can you give us some highlights, some of the highlights of the collection? Oh, my goodness. Highlights. Well, you have books that go back to the 12th century. You have the first Bible right outside here that was ever printed um, with type. So the Gutenberg Bible, that was something, 1500. And then you have books that are, you would call them graphic now, Audubon books with the beautiful birds and all types of things. It's just, there's so many things. That's what's so wonderful about it. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a magical place. Yeah. You all feel the magic, right? Sitting in this room. You well, we were stomping around. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, young man in the red? Um, well, so earlier you were telling me, my friends, about Frogman. So oh, yeah. What else do you know about Frogman? Frog yeah, so, so earlier we were, we were hanging out, and they were asking me what my favorite superhero was. And Frogman is definitely one of my favorite superheroes. He's an obscure character from the Marvel Universe. And he, he doesn't have any superpowers. He just wears a, a costume that makes him look like a frog. So his whole thing is this. His whole thing is this. Um, he is the son of a supervillain named the Leapfrog, who would use his frog suit to go and rob banks. And then he finds out that his dad is this criminal and he feels really bad about it. So he steals the suit from his dad and becomes a superhero called Frogman. And his superpowers are? His superpower is at the bottom of his suit, on each of his feet, are giant springs. So he could just jump around. And that's his whole power. Yeah. I'm learning a lot. <laughs> it's good. Oh, yep. Do you write and illustrate your books, or does somebody else do it? Do I write and illustrate my books? It depends on the book. So um, there are some books where I do both the writing and the drawing, and there are other books where I only do the writing, and somebody else does the drawing. I work with a friend of mine who does the drawing. So it depends on the book. So we have time for a couple more questions? One more, One question? more question? Oh, my. One more question. Okay. So how, uh, the, how about the young lady with glasses, sunglasses? Do you prefer Marvel, uh, Marvel or DC Comics? I want to oh. hear. I'd like to hear your. Do you have an answer to this? No. Dr. Hayden? <laughs> I'm just getting into it between Frogman, <laughs> I'm Jeff the Weirdo, I'm and have some to of the others. I have to start reading, and this is going to be my reading without walls. I'm sure. going to get into real comic books. That's my pledge. I'm going to have to send, I'll have to send I'm going to I'll read, to and this is my reading challenge. I'm going to, and it's going to be fun because I'm going to go in the comic store and they're going to say, what is she doing in here? <laughs> and I'm going to go in the comic store and I'm going to pick out some Marvel comics. Any suggestions besides? For Marvel Super comics, Ms. Marvel. Ms. Ms. Marvel. Marvel is oh. Great. Yeah, it's, it's the, uh, uh, it's about the, the first, it's a, it's a Muslim American young girl. Okay. Who has the power to make any part of her body as big or as small as she wants. Oh, so I can use that. It's super big. It's awesome. Or super and then, small. And then totally awesome Hulk. Okay. Well. And then DC comics. And then, and then DC Batgirl is amazing. It's awesome. Batgirl is a, a, a wonderful comic. And Supergirl is also wonderful. Okay. So do they have any librarian comic characters? Are there any librarian comic characters? There was one called The Answer which is about uh, a librarian who becomes best friends with a superhero. That's, I'm gonna look for that one too. Yeah. So that's my <laughs> reading without walls. I pledge that I will go and get some real comics. That's and my great. question that's for you great. too, we, you talk, when we talk about graphic novels, what about nonfiction? What do you call them? Because a novel seems yes. to be fiction. Yes, I, So a I book agree. like March is a graphic yeah. book? Yeah, I agree. I agree. So, so to, to answer that young lady's question for me, uh, nowadays, because I write for DC, I'm kind of a DC guy. But when I was a kid, when I was your age, I read more Marvel than DC. But, but the, the, the term graphic novel is a little bit clumsy. 
right? Because we use it to describe things that actually aren't novels at all, like okay, March. Okay, that's what March I... is, March is, uh, is it's real. It's not a novel, it's, it's nonfiction, it's an autobiography. Uh, the, the New York Times deals with this by calling them graphic books instead of graphic novels. Okay. But I do think that the term graphic novel, even though it's a little bit, it's a little bit weird, it refers to a publishing format. Okay. Yeah. So rather than what so type of it, it, rather than what type? Yes. Okay. Rather than what type? All right. It looks like we're just about out of time. I want to thank all of you and who are thank in this you. room, and those of you who are joining us. Through the cameras, thank you so much for being here. It was wonderful to talk to you all. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Now, who gets who gets to take Jeff the weirdo <laughs> home? How are we going to decide that? I don't know. How, are we gonna How do you do that where you do a thing and you, you decide? All right, let's, let's, we'll do this. We'll do, we'll do a trivia challenge. Ooh. Somebody tell me, I mentioned this earlier. Somebody tell me when did Superman debut? When was issue, the, when was his first comic published? When was his first comic published? And don't look it okay, up. Okay, so the, the, the young man in the Dragon Ball Z? Okay. Do you remember? 1938. Close, very close, but, but not quite right. Not quite right. Okay. About around the 1930s. Um, it is the 1930s. Yep. I want an exact exact, exact number. Go year. ahead, young lady. Exact year. Close. Very close. Very close. Okay, over here. Yes. 1933. No, very close. 1939. No. No. Oh. In the back, over there. 1931. 1931. Okay, young lady, right there with the headband. Close, ooh, so close, come on. 1937? That's right, that's right, 1937, all right. So you get Jeff the Weirdo. And you're the one that, you get Jeff the Weirdo because you thought about his sidekick, the cherry. Yeah, that's right, Pee -pee. that's right. You were the one that made up the talking cherry. So you have to get that. Right, thank, thank you, Gene. Thank you so much. Thank you thank so you. much.